we're back for the second time in like four or five days. Can't get enough of us or something. How's it going? <laughs> oh, I did not make enough of this drink for tonight, I don't think. I just thought that. I was like, damn, I think I need like a like two refills. Yeah. So what's going on? Are you ready for a uh, monoculture talk? Yes, I am. I have been awesome. very excited for this for a long time. Awesome. <laughs> it so, sounds diabolical, but it's not. <laughs> it's not. Mostly not. So <laughs> if you're not familiar with this project, the Gastropocene, uh, Aisha Khan, a.k.a. the woke scientist on Instagram, as well as me, Andy, from the Poor Pearls Almanac, uh, we, we kind of went down this little rabbit hole. And we started with this idea of putting together a little zine talking about the relationships between food and ecology and climate change and uh, what, what it means to be human and trying to intersect all of those different things. And that kind of snowballed into what was going to be a one a one page or two page zine into I think we're we're planning chapter four. And yeah, we've it looks really... like it's going to be closer to like a full, full book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it, it's been really interesting and it's really fun to explore this subject of like how how does our food systems reflect um, who we are as people and how does that reflect or impact the health of an ecosystem? And um, what are the things we can learn from what we've done in the past, what we're doing in the present to figure out what we're going to do for the future with climate change and um, you know the the state of the global ecology and how those are not separate issues, which is what we talked about last week, is how climate change is a reflection of the ecological damage we've uh, committed across the globe. And um, food is a part of that. So that that's what we've been trying to unpack. And today we're talking primarily about monocultures. And while monocultures do get a very bad rap for very good reasons, uh, we're going to talk about it with a little bit more nuance. So, I mean, I think most people will say like, yeah, I understand like having monocrops of thousands of acres of corn is a bad thing, but like we're, we're going to go in a little bit deeper than that. And I, I think it'll be um, really insightful for a lot of people. Yeah. So, and I think um, also maybe pe we, we're also trying to expand the definition of monocultures a little bit, right. To add that nuance um, to people think of, Maybe don't even realize where, in terms of thinking about where your food actually comes from, um, that it may, it still comes from these like large industrial agricultural corporation run farms that have these monocrops, which is like Andy said, like one type of crop grown for thousands of acres. Um, but that's a plantation. That's the design of a plantation, right? And these monocrop, like these, the the way that these uh, monocrop plantations are structured, it's, it's it's a colonial concept that's just been retained under capitalism because the whole reason slavery even was created was to meet the increased labor demands of like wanting to increase, maximize productivity and yield on these monocrop plantations and get more profit, right? Um, and people, I guess, sometimes don't realize that that like where our food comes from, those colonial global dynamics of like um, whole countries depending on monocrops, basically their entire economies hinging on monocrops um, is like that was created during colonialism, right? Because under empires, empires tasked different colonies with making like only coffee or only tea or only oil or only people, I guess. Um, and now that's still very much the case, right? Even with like outsourced labor, like cheap labor basically being outsourced to like the global South. Um, and we also talked about expanding the definition of monocultures to thinking about just like biodiversity as a form of just cultural diversity too, because we all, always think of biodiversity as just like, oh, look outside your window and you have like four types of plants. Wow. Um, but it also means uh, it's a lot deeper than that to think about cultural diversity and retaining cultural diversity, which means we have to be okay with being with people that are different than us and understanding and learning from each other without having to like stuff each other out, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think you brought up some really good points about like this idea of like outsourcing this model of uh, the plantation, right? Where there's these monocultures, um, and this has been done in a number of different ways historically. Um, since World War II in particular, we've seen this outsourcing of uh, the monocrops that we think of today, right? This thousands mm -hmm. of acres, heavy use of chemicals, pesticides, and things like that, uh, heavy use of fertilizers. And that that has been brought under the, the term green revolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that's played out in a number of different countries, not you know, it's not just something that we've tried once or twice. We we did this in Mexico um, 50 years ago. 
we did in Africa 50 years mm -hmm. ago. We tried it again, um, and we're still trying it right now in mm -hmm. uh, Africa through like Bill Gates and, uh, primarily and uh, the a Green Revolution in Africa, which we, we talked about a bit on the Pork Rolls Almanac. And this has also been played out in India where they're uh, dealing with that mess right now and trying to clean up what, uh, what the consequences of industrialization for their food system. So this is something that uh, we, we've created this footprint. We've tried to apply it to multiple parts of the world with completely different ecosystems, completely different climates, with the idea that as long as we provide enough water and we can put the nutrients into the soil, it's just going to work. And it's repeatedly not worked. <laughs> it worked for like a short period of time and then like quickly dissipated, right? Yeah. And I mean, I, it, it brings up like an important point, I think, for people to think about, because we got a lot of comments on our posts uh, talking about like, you know, there must be some utility to monocultures. And we'll talk a little bit about like some of the lessons that we've taken away from that that might be helpful in the future. But uh, people bring up like, oh, this is not just something that came about during colonialism. Like this is, you know, we might to feed 8 billion people. We need monocrop plantations, right? As, as though that is going to be the way that we feed people. And that shows this fundamental disconnect with even understanding that this planet is like, like it comes from a misunderstanding of resources and how they're scarce, which is like the scarcity mindset that's bred under capitalism, right? Um, which doesn't understand that this, this planet and all other ecological niches are self-sustainable and can be. If you allow for the critical processes of, for example, biodiversity to happen, because that's what makes it self-sustainable, right? Um, like in order for a system to be able to care for, cultivate, and sustain all life forms that are living within it. You actually need to allow for all of the intricate, complex interactions that happen with all of these living organisms in those in that ecological niche to actually happen. And that's what capitalism doesn't allow for, right? So we went from like 10,000 diverse, basically plants that were being consumed by different cultures around the world to now majority of the world eating corn, soy, wheat, rice. <laughs> and that's, that is not going to come at like that's not going to just be something that we're not going to pay for right in terms of short term and long term both and i think we talked a little bit about short term issues in terms of like these crops lack critical micronutrients and what happens to the soil when you just try to grow these crops at the rate that you're growing them that just more food doesn't necessarily mean more nutrition um, and doesn't mean that we're actually feeding 8 billion people the way we should be feeding 8 billion, 8 billion people. And also that we should never think of one person feeding 8 billion people. It's probably going to be you and your homies feeding each other. <laughs> That's a very different model. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that brings up this uh, really interesting, like, uh, dynamic in what food systems look like. And I think this has underscored a lot of what we've been talking about is, uh, ultimately a lot of the discussion around food mm -hmm. systems that we've had to this point are predicated on this idea of like food being this abstract thing that exists and you know moves into your your household or whatever it might be and <laughs> um you know it's not like a part of your community it's not a part of your identity and as we've discussed uh off recording as well as i think i think uh, peripherally in some of the stuff we've written is that food is a part of our identity right and why is it a part of our identity in our culture because that is what makes up the the landscape around us right that, that's what we share with our family and our friends, right? So food is not just the thing that it is today. And that's a fundamental part of this, right? That, um, you know, we, we eat food, we eat you know, a bag of potato chips. We have no connection to that bag of potato <laughs> chips, right? Yeah. And even like culturally speaking, like I, I'm Italian. Um, like I, I my, even though my, my parents are from Italy, um, my connection to the food of Italy is very different than theirs when they lived there. And, you know, my, my dad could look out the window and say like that, you know, that's where the food came from. Um, and yeah. like, let me tell you about this history of the food. It's not just like growing it. It's the history and the yeah. connection and it's and place I mean, in a landscape. Yeah. And I mean, we talked a little bit about it last time in the context of green capitalism and greenwashed like products, right? So products that are claiming to be eco-friendly, cruelty-free, like uh, vegan corporations, for example, that literally their entire marketing scheme is that they are more ethical, right? Um, and that's why it's so important to parse that uh, a little and look at it a little bit closer because uh, you don't actually know where that food comes from. You don't know who's growing the ingredients that are required to make impossible burgers. Um, and uh, essentially the human and like 
animal plant toll in terms of the ecosystems that it's destroying, right? Because those, the ingredients for those products are also produced on these monocrop plantations. Like that's exactly where they come from, right? Um, and I think what it, the only thing it shows is this disconnect uh, that capitalism has forcefully disconnected us from our land and separated us from, from everything that we care about, like people and our food, to where we actually don't have a relationship with the food. Um, and we think that, uh, like I, I think I mentioned, that it's just ridiculous to even think of switching diets overnight. Like even that concept of just like, oh, I'm just going to go to the store and just like buy like a whole other thing and just like, you know, cook whole other meals because I have no culture. I have no traditions. I have, you know, food means nothing to me. I can just switch my diets overnight. Right. And that's such a capitalist colonial concept. And at the same time, it also shows that in a world where we're trying to build relationships like with our food and beyond capitalism and beyond a transactional society, that the way we would do that is we would actually have to grow our own stuff in community and rely on each other and do so by building relationships with each other. And that's how communities have done food for years, <laughs> for, for centuries outside of capitalism and colonialism. And it would be truly ridiculous for them, given that they've come up with food systems after hundreds of years of like experimentation, seeing what works for their ecological niche, right? What makes sense for their cultural traditions and values and what genuinely sustains their ecosystem because it's not, it, it has to be sustainable, right? Um, and those, those traditions and those techniques and those skills get applied to food systems. And it is truly ridiculous to break that kind of intimate, like ancestral centuries long tradition and just say, I'm just going to do something different tomorrow. <laughs> right. Like it doesn't make any sense. And I think that's kind of what we wanted to delve into. Like, how do we then think, keep that in mind and not come up with these like reductive solutions that are really just non solutions? <laughs> yeah. And I think part of that greenwashing is also um, marketing or these organizations understanding through their marketing that they can sell that cultural piece to us and that is part of like we're replacing cultural identity with like these with politics it's it's also part of why our politics are so strained today and everything is such a fucking shit show like in terms mm -hmm. of like discussing anything political right because we don't have a cultural framework that we can yeah. like you know we agree on all these things because they're a cultural norm right so like we can disagree on these things but we know we're like both good people even if we don't agree with everything and that doesn't exist anymore because we don't have any like community. We don't have any mm -hmm. like accountability for each other. Like I know like cancel culture is supposed to be this mm -hmm. thing that's accountability, but if you don't have community, it's just people shouting at each other on the internet. Oh, like, and I mean, that's, know? I think we may have talked about this a while uh, on, on, I think it was a live stream that we did on talking to your family and friends with yes. that, like, about political stuff without using any jargon and just being accessible. Right. And not, making it about theory, just like a human being talking to your family and friends about this stuff, because we do believe that that can be done without knowing a lick of theory. Um, and I think we, we just like discussed how digital capitalism and social media just desecrates all of our interactions and what like cancel culture is really a product of people being, you know, feeling whatever they feel behind keyboards and seeking validation online and thinking that just because they call someone names, right? If you call someone racist or if you call someone sexist or homophobic, that it means that you're not automatically when that's not actually what that means. Cause you actually have to act and show up every day and, you know, do the thing in your relationships. And <laughs> like, nothing is a given, right? You can't, I, I don't really care what you call yourself. It doesn't mean anything unless you don't show up in your day to day life and your relationships. Right. Um, but I think it, it's gotten people to feel like really, 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 really safe behind keyboards and think that that's like relationships, but it's not right. And it's also at the same time, severed them from real life relationships. And I think we talked about how it was very difficult uh, for us because when we were like in the, I guess when we grew up or when we learned a lot of these things, uh, I didn't learn anything from social media about this stuff. You know, like that, it wasn't a time where like what we did with Facebook was post on each other's walls and ask how our summers went. Right. Like, but no one shared informa political information on Facebook. So I never actually had that. So everything I learned right now is just from like grassroots organizing and like being in community around other people to where if people challenged me or said something different that like, even if it made me feel uncomfortable or triggered me, I know them, I, I've built relationships with them 
they're like kind people that have shown up for me. I'm not just going to be like block, delete, cancel. You know, I'm not just going to leap to, it's so much harder to jump to conclusions. It's so much harder to make assumptions about people mm-hmm. when you're actually in community with them. Yeah. You, you can't rely on straw mans to like make your argument. And, and uh, you have to be okay with multiple different approaches coexisting. Yeah. And I think um, to bring this back, like that also comes to our conversation around monocultures is that like, yes, there's a lot of places where they're not appropriate, but there are some that are. Um, so uh, before we get to the the some that are, um, do you want me to talk a little bit about the history of monocultures and monocrops or did you? Want yeah, to- yeah, okay. yeah. So uh, a big piece of this, and we kind of covered this last, uh, the last episode. So this is going to be a really quick summation of it, that um, monocrops are the, came from basically, if you want to really go historically back, uh, at the scale that we think of today from the Dust Bowl. And that was because during the Dust Bowl, there were obviously food shortages. And, um, you know, one of the basic premises of how civilizations exist and how states exist is that they control power, right? And power comes from ultimately being able to feed people. That That is the core function of, you know, buying into the idea of living in a civil a city, right? Or a, a community, a civilization, whatever, a state. You know, you, you live in the state with the understanding that, like, I will follow these rules as long as I can have my basic needs met. When those needs no longer exist, you don't give a shit what the state has to say, right? When you, don't, you can't feed yourself, though, you don't care. Mm-hmm. And um, when the Dust Bowl hit, um, it became very re- uh, real that there was a, comp- a potential for us to not be able to feed all of the citizens in the country. So after the Dust Bowl, once we got that kind of situated, it became a, a very big priority for the U.S. government to make sure there was always surpluses of food, even if there was no use for it. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, even though we were meeting the demand in terms of like what they were producing every year and with major crops, it was always about how can we produce more? How can we breed them to grow more? Um, even though we don't need it today, we might need it in the future. If we have a bad year next year, I want to know that we have enough surplus from the previous year that we can cover that difference. And, um, with the the world wars and the developments of technologies, um, it became very apparent that we can turn a lot of wartime technologies into producing pesticides and fertilizers. So that became the new model for uh, taking care of the soil in terms of making sure plants can continue to grow and provide the, the caloric needs of the, the country. So between uh, World War II decimating the rest of the world and our a uh, newfound discovery of how to grow food very quickly, especially with corn, because corn is uh, C4 grass. It grows exceptionally fast. Um, and it had been bred by uh, indigenous people to have a ton of diversity in its genetic code. Um, they figured out very quickly how to make it grow just like ridiculously amount, uh, high amounts of uh, calories. So, with, though, I'll say with though, not the radical idea and understanding of like relationships, right? You know, like for example, corn, what it means to indigenous communities is not, it, it was like literally thinking that uh, same, the same colonial foundations of thinking that food or anything is a commodity, right? It can be isolated and separated from the way that it was uh, developed, the culture that it came from, and it can be created into this product that can be then mass produced and maximized yield and, you know, like skyrocket profits. It can feed everybody. Like it was this like very reductive isolationist sort of individualistic understanding of even food, right? Just like people are treated in a vacuum, food is treated in a vacuum because it's separated from like everything else right and that is yeah. basically like colonial logic yeah and this this played out in a number of different ways so you had the fact that they'd created this dent corn that uh was incredibly good at storing had high calorie content um grew basically anywhere as long as you threw fertilizer at it um and then they realized like as various um bugs and viruses and parasites came up that like they would see a crop get decimated and they're like okay you know what we're, we're only growing seven different strains if one of them gets taken out, we're screwed. What are, what's our backup plan? Um, so what they started to do in the 60s and uh, was even before the 60s, they started going out into uh, indigenous communities, primarily in Mexico, where corn had originated and started collecting a lot of these uh, heirloom plants, uh, mm-hmm. land raised plants that had evolved to very specific conditions and brought them back into these um, storage facilities. With exactly. the idea, like, <laughs> we're going to stick them here. We've got all this genetic code. No matter what happens, one of these plants will have genetic code that is resistant to 
whatever comes up, right? But the problem is, like, you can't just stick that stuff in a safe forever. And also, like, you know, when you when you understand plants and how they grow, there's uh, what's called plasticity, and that plasticity means that the corn or the genetic code um, changes what uh, characteristics show up based on where it's grown. So just like you, human beings, right? Just yeah. like we talk about in terms of our health being shaped, it's not an equal balance between nature and nurture. It's actually mostly nurture. Yeah. <laughs> and it's mostly our environment and our sociopolitical conditions that shape our health, right? And our genetic code literally adapts and evolves and changes to the oppressive conditions that we're put under, right? And it's the same exact thing for, as you can imagine, for all living beings, including plants. <laughs> Yeah. So they've they've started building this facility to try to like store this genetic code, knowing that like our food system was reliant on like having a backup plan and um, like that obviously fell short. And they're continuously since the 60s been trying to figure this out because they'll be like, oh, we're going to grow like a bunch of it. The, the experiments fail because they're growing it in like Texas thinking like, yeah, it's warm enough and it doesn't ever work. And, and, and the why, like the why, like it, it's this grand, um, it's sort of this microcosm of capitalism failing, uh, you know, just like just a catastrophe uh, because it op it is colonialism, right? And it operates on this fundamental logic of commodifying like survival essentials, like food and turning them to products, taking people and turn objectifying people and turning them into products, right? Taking animals and plants and turning them into products. So it still operates on those like base principles. So it's kind of like interesting to see all of this efforts made to deal with problems that emerge as a result of colonial logic, right? With like monocrops. And then their solutions still work within the framework of colonialism, where you put the whole idea of capitalism is to put the least in to get the most out, right? Yeah. So it's like, they'll just throw like even more intense toxic like herbicides or antimicrobials into the soil to try to like combat a pathogen or a pest that overgrows right and it's just like the the simple idea of care is not there because capitalism doesn't give, give a shit about care right everything yeah. is about like the dehumanized and like the total objectification of whatever you're dealing with yeah, and you brought up this idea of like commodification. I think that's a really appropriate term to understand why this failed and why it's continuing to fail is because they treat these things like these static, like mm -hmm. things you can buy, like a like a product. Yeah. Yeah, like a glass or you know, a microphone or whatever. Like you buy it, you own it for life, and like it doesn't change. It's just a thing that you can put on a shelf and it's gonna be there as long as you need it. And uh, that's not how like the world works, right? Everything's dynamic. These plants are in, in relations with the biology around them. And that's what mm -hmm. helps them grow and continue to be what they are. So in this process, they've failed repeatedly, but they've uh, evolved to understand that there is this like necessary need to try to figure this out, um, which in some ways, I guess, really hopeful in terms of like mass famine, but also um, a little concerning in terms of like the con continuity of capitalism. So, uh, that that kind of explains like where our corn system has come from and kind of where we are today, where they're still trying to figure this out. And with like genetic manipulation and gene editing and things like that, um, we are getting to a point where they can start to actually cut these specific codes out of one corn variety cultivar and stick them in another one. And um, some people are very uh, optimistic about the potential of that. I'm I'm on the fence. Um, to, you know, I'm, not. I, I'm, not, I'm not qualified <laughs> enough to have a strong opinion. I and I mean, what they're using is it's like, I don't know if anyone has done like been in a lab or you've, you've heard of like CRISPR Cas9, right? Like it's, you've probably done the thing. It's not, it's not that complicated in terms of understanding how we can edit genetic code. It's all types of controversial. And I think people maybe understand the ethics of doing that when applied to human beings, right? There's all this ethical stuff of uh, editing genetic code and getting it to be exactly what you want it to be and how problematic that is because it's eugenics. I, I really think it's important to start thinking about uh, like abolishing some of those hierarchies when it comes to plants and animals and everything else too, right? Like forcing, uh, something to become the thing that you want it to be in this like isolationist environment and not giving a shit about like the environment it grows in all the interact like severing its relationships with like other plants right and other animals and other pollinators and 
other like communal me community members that it relies on to be what it is, like just like we do, right? And then growing it in a tube and being like, I'm just going to edit its genetic code so it can be just like perfect, right? Like it doesn't work with people and it doesn't work with plants. <laughs> and it's the same reason why it doesn't, right? Because we're all part of something greater than ourselves. And the moment you isolate us in a tube, it's not going to work out very well. Yeah, I, like I said, I am not a science scientist, so I will I will defer to you on that one. Um, but that that is basically the last 80 years of uh, monocrop development, specifically around corn uh, that we've seen. And uh, soy is a very similar subject. Uh, we covered it a bit last week mm -hmm. uh, in terms of like our relationships with uh, Southeast Asia and how that impacted our involvement with soy production and why it is the way where it is today. Mm -hmm. um, and part of why monocrops are so prominent today is because of uh, processed foods, because uh, corn being the thing that we could figure out how to grow really well, got shoved into everything. Corn oil is a really good preservative. It's used on all of your foods. When it's not corn oil, it's soy oil. Uh, it's rapeseed oil. It's all these different plants that um, have these oils that are naturally preservatives, just like anything else you would put in a, a jar of oil. It has the same basic general properties between salt and oil. You can basically preserve anything. So that is why, despite, and as we talked about in a few episodes, and if you want further details on what that sounds like or why this is uh, the case, even if we stopped eating meat, those products or those monocrops would continue to be grown. So yeah. that is kind of where we stand today. Now let's talk about monocultures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess this was the, um, the first time maybe where we explicitly tried to address <laughs> some of the, some of the shit that we got the first time around that we did this, where we made a very controversial claim that green capitalism is cap still, you know, capitalism, um, and told people to not be assholes and uh, colonizers that want to erase other people's cultures because they think they're better. And it was like, what? <laughs> like we got we got called like what rapists and murderers for making that claim and being like, you know, no one is above accountability and criticism. Like, uh, anyways, so we tried to address a that into a little bit more granularity, right? And and one of that um, one of the ways that we talked about it is by talking about how biodiversity is directly a, you can talk about it being an interplay of or a part of cultural diversity, right? Especially when we see ourselves as stewards of like land or oceans or like the, the ecological niches that we live in, our cultures being diverse is what makes the ecological niche diverse itself, right? Um, because that's how, like, that's literally what cultures mean for, for communities uh, that have them. <laughs> And uh, colonialism really has, a, that's what colonialism has done, right? It's, it's erased cultural diversity and it's erased basically systems and uh, traditional knowledge systems and replaced them with like one size fits all global model, right? That must be enforced everywhere. And so it's, it's, it's a byproduct, I think, of people not realizing that we are all subject to being socialized under these systems. So we have to sort of be wary of it and catch ourselves um, because we can't come up with solutions that are still falling back on the same logic, right? So the idea that there is an, a solution that's a one-size-fit-all solution, right? If the world just ate plants, then we would just stop climate change and the ecological like destruction and collapse that we're headed towards, right? Um, that is, again, this colonial logic of, okay, if everyone just did the thing that I think is best, everything would be okay again, right? And it's like, remember the last time that that happened? That did not go so well, right? Like the last time people thought they were going to save the world by, you know, just <laughs> converting people, that it did not go well. <laughs> and yeah. Even getting people to think critically about it's great for you to, to like raise awareness about whatever your like, you know, choices are, whatever your practices are. But it's one thing to do that in a way where you're trying to basically claim superiority and claim that other people are inferior or immoral or unethical. And therefore, the or the at best need to be converted and saved from their ignorant backward ways. Right. Like if you just knew, you know, that your recipes can made be can be made with like soybean, like you would just, you know, then you would of course, willingly embrace plant-based diets, right? That kind of judgment that's passed down. And I think we talked about the like very tangible, practical implications that that has, which is like it kills biodiversity, right? And um, that's not the solution that we can push for. And I think something that we talked about that was maybe important for people to realize, like if we take our comment section and made that just like a real life thing, right? <laughs> in, in real life, that actually happens all the time. 
And uh, one example of that is basically looking at like South Asian politics and understanding how the talking point of meat eating be, being immoral and savage or whatnot has literally been used and leveraged to oppress minority communities in South Asia. And basically now there's like 20 out of 29 states that have bans on like specifically beef um, and cow, anything related to cow consumption, even though oddly America is like, by far the largest producer of dairy products, which are these like mul like massive corporations, right, that are financing the same political party that tells people not to eat meat, right, which tells you a lot about how it's not about like caring about animals at all, right, because the dairy industry is, is, <laughs> is industrial agriculture, right, that's what it is. So capitalist agriculture. So at the same time, um, just it's just a talking point that's leveraged through the lens of identity politics, right, to get people to then just breed hatred towards each other. And if, they, if they're fighting each other, they're not fighting the systems that are killing them both, right? And that's basically the point for all of this. And that's why we wanted to even talk about it, to get people to realize that we shouldn't misdirect our energy towards things that are not going to actually help. Yeah, so I think the, um, to, to talk about this idea of monocultures, um, I think one of the things that we have to be really good and thoughtful about is acknowledging the good of monocrops in terms of what they are capable of and uh because I, I do feel like we sometimes get into these kind of straw man arguments about like you know you'll hear people say like i can produce more calories in an acre using you know, food forest methods blah 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 and like okay that that is possibly I, I i disagree but possibly true um but but let's like unpack that a little bit so like corn is incredibly good at growing food it's been bred through artificial, you know, like steroids to grow mm -hmm. food. Like, of course, you're you're putting in more inputs. It's going mm -hmm. to produce more per acre than anything mm -hmm. else. Like, there's no reason it shouldn't. And it is very mm -hmm. good at that. Mm -hmm. But, like, let's unpack that a little bit further when we think about, like, all right, we, we are living, historically speaking, in, in terms of the human existence on the earth in a very unique period in time. The, this is going to be a blip the last hundred years from mm -hmm. 1910 to 2050, 2060, um, where cheap fertilizers have existed, cheap energy has existed. Like this is a blip in time that will not exist for much longer. Uh, mm -hmm. And we are on the tail end of that. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we live like as though that is, this is the future. Like things are going to keep going this way forever. We are going to fix, like, we're going to find an alternative that's lower energy and everything's just going to be great forever. Uh, with While ignoring the ecological destruction and the climate change impacts. And um, like I said, that's why we talked about the idea of how does climate change relate with ecological destruction? Because it is a byproduct of that ecological destruction. And yeah. if we find a cheaper way to produce petrochemicals, uh, that doesn't go away. But we have to understand exactly what uh, like monocropping with like corn is. It's a very fast, efficient, um, effective way of providing calories for people in uh, as a trade off with the ecological health. Right. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean to understand monocrops outside of that mm -hmm. framework? And it does exist. Um you know, you well, can try. I'll say, like, when, when we're talking about monocrops, the thing that I think is an important differentiator is the scale, right? Yeah. Um, the scale being like that is the colonial component, right? Because the whole idea is maximum yield and productivity and profits to no end, right? To no end. If it's just like exponential growth, that's the model, right? And um, we're trying to think of essentially that the last, you know, 200 years, 300 years, have led to a significant impact where the landscape that we're dealing with, with food and energy and available resources does not look the same as it did 300 years ago. It just doesn't, right? Um, so even in terms of communities taking their, like going back and returning to the traditional systems, those traditional systems are not stagnant, right? They're adaptive and they have to adapt to existing environmental stressors and existing emergent community needs, right? So I think a lot of this is about thinking like, how can we take lessons we've learned from the last 300 years and also like essentially decolonize and return to traditional systems and then come up with adaptations, like ways to actually work with what, what we have instead of sort of this like glorified ideal <laughs> that we have in our heads of what it might look like. Yeah, absolutely. So 
uh, there, there's a number of different examples um, of what this can look like. Uh, and I think that's why it's really important to start thinking about our historical, the history of the landscapes where we've lived, uh, where we live today, where we've lived ancestrally, um, because uh, because of climate change, it's not going to be a, hey, this is how we did things 400 years ago. Let's go back to that. that mm -hmm. And most places in the country is no longer an option. Um, mm -hmm. Those foods might not be able to grow in those places. And for um, most communities that are dispersed around the world, it is no longer an option to return to their traditional system because they're just not on the land that they used to be on. Right. And that, too. Yeah. So, um, you know, when, when we talk about this idea of like sustainable ethical monocrops, what does that actually look like? And um, a really good example would be like the Anishinaabe uh, rice um, that they would grow in the Great Lakes, which could span hundreds of acres. Uh, these giant, you know, uh, areas where rice would grow and would be wild collected. And uh, part of that collection process was to return uh, rice back to the lake to continue that process. And um, what's really important to understand when we talk about monocultures like that is it's not just that the landscape is capable of supporting those monocultures, but also that um, the monoculture really isn't uh, a monocrop. Mm -hmm. It is, um, it has other things happening there. Yeah. It is not and it has complex a... interactions with like all of these other microbes and animals and plants in that environment. And it's no longer like just the one size fits all thing that we think of. Yeah, it's not this land is flat, so therefore I'm going to grow corn on it. Yeah. It is the very unique conditions which that plant needs. Yes. And that can be dictated by human intervention as well mm -hmm. um, through, you know, management, stewardship, fires, uh, you know, blocking, you know, rivers, things like that, that uh, humans as well as other animals have done in terms of managing a landscape. Um, but that it is much more nuanced and complex than just simply, again, mm -hmm dumping a monocrop not on profit the incentivized, right? And that's yeah. the most important thing. The goal is not profit. The goal is not to deplete, like literally the, the, the reason that land was taken away by plantation owners. And like the whole idea was that, oh, good God, these indigenous folks are not doing the most that they can with their land, right? This land can be depleted even more. And it's like so much lost potential. So it's not with that kind of goal in mind, right? Yeah. Um, it's with the goal of actually sustaining your community that's living on this yeah. land and has to sustain it because you care about the land. Yeah, and that's actually uh, some of the reports when visiting uh, what's now Michigan uh, mm -hmm. from the colonists was saying like these these indigenous people are so wasteful. They keep letting yeah. the rice fall into the lake. Yeah. And it was like, well, yeah, that that's where it's growing from. <laughs> that, that's <laughs> yeah. how this works. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, it, it just like spoke to like this very, um, very commodified yeah. understanding of the relationship uh, between the landscape and the people that were stewarding it. Yeah. And, um, but while... also even the word that you use intervention, I think it's really important because the other narrative sometimes that people think is going to solve ecological disaster is this like, you know, just like this primitivist, like don't do anything to nature. Like it actually ironically shows a removal from nature <laughs> by talking about ourselves as though we're separate from nature and we shouldn't, uh, you know, we shouldn't participate in nature. We shouldn't actively like Basically, it shows that people think that the only relationship that we can have with other like living beings around us is destructive. And it shows this, again, reductive understanding that like that's that's just colonialism, capitalism. We've actually done it. We've had more ge regenerative relationships with the, being a part of nature for thousands of years outside of that context. Right. And yeah. that like part of our community stewarding the lands that we're on and stewarding our oceans literally means you're taking care of it, maintaining it, doing the cleanups that are necessary, doing like maintaining this intricate balance. Right. And that involves tons of intervention, <laughs> right. Yeah. That involves us actively getting down and dirty. And I think that is in contrast, in fact, with the way that people talk about like just doing a dramatic lifestyle change, right? Just switching up your diet to eat more ethical products. That shows a removal from nature. That shows the lack of intervention with anything because you're not actually participating in the process of making that soy or anything, right? That you're just going to a store and buying it off of, and if you can afford it, if you have access to that, if you're not in a food desert, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if you don't care about it, you know, desecrating the, your culture, then yeah, sure, you can go buy it, you know? Uh, then that that works for some people, right? Yeah. But it still shows that we need to be very much willing to do what it takes. And that's not going to be the pretty picture that people build in their head of us just like, you know, taking like hikes, <laughs> right? That's not us participating in nature. It's us willing to do whatever it takes to maintain our ecosystems.
Yeah. And what I think is really interesting. So, you know, I brought up this idea of like that monocrops, like specifically corn are like, you know, ridiculously productive. Right. However, um, you know, so the, the obvious argument is like, well, how are we going to feed people if we don't have these monocrops? Right. And the answer is that there's 13 percent of the U.S. land ba- uh, land mass is protected forests like what is a protected forest? Like just bring up what you're talking about. A protected forest is a forest where people are not a part of it, right? Mm-hmm. Where inherently part of being human historically has been to be involved. There's never really been quote unquote mm-hmm. protected lands uh, mm-hmm. with the exception of like the most, you know, the mountaintops, things like that. Yeah. Um, so, and so what we mean by protected lands today literally means like, like communities defending land and water against corporations destroying it. Right. That's what we talk about today, but that's not historically been, the, we've always existed in relationship with the lands that we're on. Yeah. And I'm talking, when I say 13%, I mean like, um, you know, federalized state yes, owned exactly. lands. Right. Exactly. So, yeah. so these lands, you know, if you live anywhere near like a hiking trail or something and it says like no fishing, no this, no mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. uh, that that's probably like state or federally protected mm-hmm. lands. Mm-hmm. You can't do anything to it around here where I live. They're mostly unhealthy. You can mm-hmm. walk through those forests and you don't see the successional process happening. You don't, you know, if you were to look at a journal from a colonist showing up 400 years ago and like walking through the landscape, it would not look anything like what it looks today. Mm-hmm. And that is because it was more productive than it was involved. There were people involved in interacting with that landscape and shaping that landscape to be productive, not just for humans, but all of the things around it, making yeah. the ecosystem healthier. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's what we're missing when we're talking about 13% of the landscape not being stewarded, um, not being managed, not being productive for people, not having relations with people. When, mm-hmm. you know, you hear these stories of like, you know, the, the oceans were so full of codfish that, you know, you could just stick a net in and pull fish out that the, the um, the, you know, you've never heard that one? No, but that sounds like it's not a very good ocean. <laughs> <laughs> the reports of Cape Cod um, talk about how the the cod uh, the the bay was so full of fish that you could literally just like stick a net in you. Oh, really? It, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I was like, if that happened off the coast of like my village, they'd be like, something's really off. <laughs> <laughs> like we need to do some damage control here. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, obviously control. it's hyperbolic a bit, but it does speak to the fact of like how uh, available and accessible fish. Yeah, were. I think what you're talking about is abundance, right? Like, yeah, I abundance. Think- Exactly. Like, I think, and and that's true, right? Like, if we look at communities logging their food systems and their traditions, and even stories that have been passed down through generations, the commonality across communities around the world, across oceans, is that we had abundance and we were able to maintain abundance, right? By feeding each other, taking care of each other, sustaining the lands that we're on. And scarcity is not just something that's fabricated under capitalism, but as a result of that, as a result of capitalism just sucking everything out of this earth, it has actually led to some real scarcity and fabricated scarcity in in like all of these situations, like for example, floods, right? Like why floods happen and, and target and specifically hit some communities the hardest. Famine, right? Why certain areas are just being scorched right now uh it's just like that is fabricated scarcity that's coming from capitalism but we've been like able to sustain populations on earth but with abundance of resources yeah and that's you know there's documentation today that there uh most research is suggesting that places like the maya um they are actually able to hold they're able to support um populations as dense as what you see today in like the northeastern United States mm-hmm. using MILPA systems. So like it's mm-hmm. completely cap- it's completely possible that we can do these things. Add in the fact that we do have the the uh, genetic development of plants. We do have um, breeding techniques and knowledge about mm-hmm. how to breed plants. You know, yeah. we think about plants that uh, were once bred um, or, you know, you think about even just like wild plants that exist today, hickories and Acorn, uh, oaks and all these different uh, trees that exist today, what we could do in terms of genetic uh, breeding, working with them to make them more productive for the entire landscape. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it. The, I think you can very quickly, um, going back to what we were talking about, like attacking straw men, like just be like, oh, you want to go live in the woods? And it's like, no, we have, we have this <laughs> knowledge that we can stand, you know, that our yeah. ancestors worked on that we can yeah. apply to the world around yeah. us and make it more and, productive. And- 
and even not just like not just ancestors before capitalism right and i think this is this is something really important to think of in terms of not being binary minded about this stuff because yes these systems are horrible but the people that have tried to do good within them are not right like i work within a colonial capitalist healthcare system but does all of the research that i've done within that framework is a total trash and just oppression no like i've tried really hard to do something right and there's tons of people like me that have done the same thing right and have come up with ways of fighting and it's actually like like you know unlike cops and like maybe wall street and bankers right there are certain things in terms of ways that people have existed by developing expertise and skills that are always going to be necessary right like healers and farmers and teachers and get, like you know all sorts of like care providers right like this is something that we're always going to need right so we don't actually have to totally abandon absolutely everything that we've done in the last 400 years because we are more than capitalism right we are more than colonialism everything i haven't done is is, is a byproduct of just me being like, you know, living under these systems, right? So it's actually interesting because when you take away that lens and when you like critically analyze and, and look at even science and medicine through a political abolitionist lens, it's like, that's where we get all of this data that shows that capitalism is the problem, right? And maybe those papers haven't done a good job of being like capitalism is the problem, but they have all the data to show that, right? Which is just a testament to that people have tried. Right. People have tried even within these systems to try to like investigate what what issues are, come up with solutions that may work. Right. But just not under the, the right system and not under the right framework. But we have learned lessons. So how do we like take that and actually like, you know, incorporate that into a decolonized sort of understanding, like ecological context of the world, I guess. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's really important because there has been a lot of really great work done. Um, and I also think, you know, to reiterate kind of what you're saying that, um, you know, I think we also sometimes get really trapped in the, the context of the world we live in today. Um, you know, I think like, you know, we, we have really important and uh, valuable conversations about things like land back um, and like the, the value of indigenous knowledge and things like that. Um, but you can look at someone like J. Russell Smith, uh, who is incredibly invaluable to like the development of like the permaculture, for example, who, uh, you know, was working with the idea of like native crops and native tree crops and um, trying to find the crops or the trees that indigenous people had done the best job, um, basically selectively breeding. And um, I think in a, a modern lens, it would be like erasing his work to continue to keep that knowledge alive um, in the vein of like colonization when in reality he was working within a context that was very different than the world we live in today mm -hmm. and um, can be really, it, it's just, it's a really complicated thing to talk about, especially on the internet because we get so caught up in like this, like binaries. gotcha yeah. moments about like who says because the binaries right thing. Is good and bad, right? Like yeah. I know, you know, more I'm right, you're wrong and there's nothing else. And, um, and I think that's what we're, we're hoping to even, talk about all of this, like getting people to even get used to thinking about learning from systems that are different than their own, right? Learning from cultures that are different than their own, because that's what makes us resilient, right? Having multiple, a multiplicity of approaches, having a multiplicity of systems and traditions and cultures that approach and tackle this like massive problem that we're dealing with, that is very nuanced when you then zoom into our local ecology, right? And it's never going to take like this massive single solution type approach to any degree. But I think it, yeah, it's just really hard to reduce any of these conversations to just binaries of like good and bad. And that's what, that's often what happens when you take, I guess, social justice movements and like try to do it through the lens of marketing, right? Where people are just like, this is all you need to do. Just cut down your carbon emissions. And you're like, what? <laughs> what does that even mean? Or just like post super woke shit on the internet and just be like, yeah, well, exactly. I'm going to say something that's totally, you know, inaccessible to 99% of people, but be like, you guys are just not ready for that. And it's like, well, okay, you got yeah, 100 you followers. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, great. I saw you post that meme that was like most of the left online is just people telling each other that they're posting something that nobody else is ready for. Yes. And that is <laughs> that is it in a nutshell. Like, unfortunately, most yeah, of my best work I mean, comes from being angry. <laughs> yeah. And it's just incredible how <laughs> just even scrolling through, you know, if people are here, like, don't do it but like hypothetically if you were to scroll through our comment sections on the posts and memes that we make in like the gastropocene series so far even 
like the biggest way people have tried to shut down what we're talking about is using, for example, identity politics, right? Like just like falling back on how dare you talk about this? You must be a, you know, like animal hater and da 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 and make assumptions and more assumptions and jump to conclusions and make and then it's just like digging a deeper grave for yourself and th that tells us i guess like it's like this manifestation of everything that's wrong with the world but like seeing it happen in this microcosm right yeah. and just tells us that like that's what people are directing their energy to and it's sucking up and consuming so much of our energy as a collective right? Like bickering <laughs> when, how is that going to help? It's bickering right? without the community piece. Like you usually yeah, bicker right. community because you spend too much time together, but oh, this is the opposite. I mean, yeah, we are spending too much time together. But... Like we are defined by bickering, like, right. Yeah. We scream at each other over dinner tables, but that shit keeps us stronger. Right. Like, like there's, there's a, there's a reason for us. And actually that's a, there's good no love to that hate part. Exactly. Yeah. So, and, and, and I mean, in that way, like a lot of these comments are people like coming around, like when we posted the third chapter, um, <laughs> so many people, uh, posted being like, Oh my God, you still have not taken accountability for your like vegan hate from the first chapter. And it's like, you are a stranger on the internet. Like we do not have a relationship. You know nothing about me. And you've just made a bunch of assumptions about who you think I am. There is no accountability with strangers on the internet. Like something as simple as that, right? Like accountability happens when you have loving, caring relationships, equitable relationships with like people, <laughs> right? Yeah. Outside of that framework, there is no accountability, right? It's just hate. It's just like blanket ad hominem attacks and calling it accountability and thinking that that's going to make you look good if you do that. And it's just like, yeah. how? Like, it's just some like, oh, cancel culture nonsense. Fuck. Yeah. So, and all this is totally related to monocultures um, <laughs> because, you know, the, I, I really think like the whole point of this like whole discussion about like abolishing monocultures, which again is kind of a straw man because we're not actually saying abolish monocultures. Um, we're saying abolish a certain type of monoculture. We should uh, we come a good up headline. with a new word though for that. It, it's a good headline, you know. It's a good headline. We should come up with a new word for talking about what we're describing because it's not, you know, like capitalist monocultures, right? And that's what most people like think about. We should come up with a different way of talking about that. Though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like that about like unfortunately, the internet is obsessed with creating new words for things that don't matter, uh, but not creating new words for like what we're talking about or like yeah. you know racism or like any ism and like the fact that there's like very different like understandings of what those terms mean right like there's a very different understanding of like somebody saying something that could be taken the wrong way as racist and like someone being like i'm a white supremacist right um, oh, yeah. or, oh or other God. supremacist right like yeah. you don't just have to be white to be a supremacist um and those are both racist but like that's not the, using that term is like totally you know, and there's all of sorts conversation, of supremacy, right? right? Yeah. Like there's all sorts of supremacy. And that's what we talked about, like in terms of just like realizing and being hyper aware that colonialism and capitalism have a great way of just rebranding themselves to be more palatable and just like replicating in people like in an insidious way. And one way they do that is by people exerting supremacy over other people. Right. And that being like the focus of what they do. And yeah. that is just another form of supremacy, but and, it, and, and that manifests with like veganism and all the things we've been talking right. about. Yep. Um, so as much as we we try to de deconnect from these things, uh, they they still manifest because they're so like fundamental to our relationships with other people in the world around us. Um, and, and I think that plays out in like the way we treat uh, monocrops. Because I'm going to try really hard to stay on topic. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, mon like, the, like cancel culture is a product of monocultures, though, right? Like, cancel culture is a product of people thinking that there's one way to be. And if people aren't their exact way, that they're the most horrible, evil people on the planet. And, and just use and not realizing that, like, we're all in, like, you know, socialized under individualism. So yeah, we have egos. And like, sometimes every part of me wants to tell someone to like, fuck off in the comments, right? It, it, Probably rightfully so, because someone that just like called me a murderer and a rapist and a slave owner or God knows what, like just for talking about, you know, maybe my culture should have the right to exist and maybe my people are not immoral just because, you know, we have relationships with animals that are beyond your understanding. Right. Um, but even even responding to that, I have to like <laughs> ask myself, is this going to help my community? Right. It's like, no, uh, is me engaging with this person like clearly this person has made up their mind about me. They're not really here to learn. Right. And I know that. So I just have to like back out. And sometimes it's hard to do that. Right. Because my ego does tell me, tell them to fuck off. 
<laughs> right? And then there's the part of me that's like, this is not going to do it anybody any good this is not how we're going to change the world so just don't you know yeah. and it's like that part has to be like we have to like nurture that voice right that's like yeah. let's do the things that are important <laughs> yeah and that's and that's what this is all about is trying to do the things that are important and mm -hmm. um you know diving into the subject like i said of what our food systems are what they could be and how that that relationship plays out in all facets of our lives right and that's fundamental to the economic system and the relation, the way we've built our built our relationships with one another because of uh, the fact that we mirror those relationships on all the other relationships we have, whether it's the our pets or our where our food comes from, or you know we have these very transactional things, yeah. um, and we think you know that our pets are our kids and like all this other shit that is like yeah. very like very bur uh, deeply buried in our relationships and our misunderstanding of how to have relations with things yeah. around us. And, and, and an embodiment of, of problems with relationships between humans, right? Like, because, yeah. like, for example, how parenting culture looks at children, right? Just the lack of agency. It's the same shit that replicates in human relationships with animals or plants, right? The last thing I'll also say is... I know a lot of times in our, like, we get feedback when we talk about these issues. Like, so just tell us what the solutions are. Just tell us what to do. You know, like, why are you talking so much about the problem? And I do want to, like, and I get that with all my work, right? And uh, I also get at the same time people being like, why don't you just tell me, like, what the easy solution is, right? Just like, you talk so much about capitalism and breaking it down and breaking down how it works and everything. Just tell me what to do, right? <laughs> well, uh, that's another example of finding solutions through the same colonial framework, right? Where you just want to turn to someone that you think is an authority figure, right? For some reason, and you want them to just tell you what to do, right? And the reason that we're like spending so much time breaking down what the problem actually is, is because we need to actually dismantle our like understanding of these issues in terms of like how we thought about them for so far, right? Like for so long, we have to actually understand uh, uh, without the jargon, without the big fancy words like carbon emissions, right? When you take that away, when we just talk to each other like human to human, well, how do these systems work, right? How do they affect our day-to-day -day lives? How do they affect what you eat and what I eat, right? And the reason we do it to this extent, right, breaking down the problem is because we believe that people can come to their own solutions and different solutions that all work, right? If you really do understand the problem to that granularity, right? And we think that there isn't one solution. So I'm not going to tell you what to do, right? That would be the opposite of like everything that we're talking about, right? But we can explore solutions. I think the approach we take is trying to like offer examples of how different communities have dealt with it, different ways of how we've personally dealt with it, right? Different ways that we've come up with what works in our our local ecology, right? And the whole idea being to give people a deep understanding of how this stuff works, what the problem actually is, right? And then also options for how many solutions have come about. And that way you get to decide, right, what makes sense for you in your community. And we're not going to tell you what to do, right? And that's fundamentally like what anarchist praxis is. Yeah, and that, and we will be in the next episode kind of uh, doing what you're talking about, exploring some of the things that have worked uh, across the globe, um, you know, kind of the, uh, I don't want to say the rules, but like some of the ways to start thinking about these solutions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like the picture guide, right? Something as simple yeah. as like, maybe not do the same thing through a capitalist lens, I think is a good, like, you know, kind of default rule that we can all yeah. follow, right? Maybe yeah, like, not embrace diversity of all kinds. <laughs> like that's yeah, a good th one. <laughs> Thinking about like what our local biology uh, yeah. is, yeah. And what it has been, um, you know, and start to unpack what that actually looks like, what those, what that work has to do. Um, yeah. So somebody mentioned a growing culture. Yeah. yeah I'm familiar with them on Instagram. Um, yeah. they've, they've done some, uh, pretty interesting stuff. Um, if you're on Instagram, I don't know if they're on Facebook, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. They're, they have an Instagram account and a sub stack also, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, anything else we didn't cover? I know I felt like we did talk about monocultures, but like in the most peripheral way possible. Which I think is good. <laughs> <laughs> the way you want to talk about them? That's exactly what I want to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm glad we finally addressed, uh, honestly, just like some of the comments that we got the first time around, right? Like, I, I want everyone that was calling us all these names to go through and read this chapter and read all the way to the end. Because I do want you to feel bad calling my grandmother a savage, like meat eating rapist or whatever the hell they people, you know, set told, told us, I really do. I want you to walk right up to my community, right in our little village and say that to them. Because 
that's what it means to do this kind of work, right? Like that's what it means to actually be in community and have these relationships and understand that like, just because people are different than you, that doesn't actually mean either one of them is better. Maybe we can actually learn from each other. And maybe there's something that these communities actually have to offer that you have no idea about, given that they're actually in relationships with their land and sustaining it, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. So I'm glad we actually addressed that part. <laughs> yeah. So if this is your first time listening to us and you're wondering what the hell we're talking about, uh, this is chapter three of our gastropocene series. Um, we've talked about uh, food systems as they exist today. Veganism is not a real solution for uh, ecological destruction, climate change. Um, monocrops, obviously today, um, we talked a bit about climate change and ecology and how those things enter are, are two. Or one is a problem, one is a symptom. And that is a very important distinction in understanding these conversations and um, starting to peel back these layers of like, what does it mean to talk about ecological destruction? Where does our food system sit in that? And that is why it's the gastropocene, our, our entire, the anthropocene is not actually the problem. It's the, mm -hmm. the way we're eating, the way we are relating with the ecosystem. The way we relate to our, yes, the way we relate to the world around us and seeing ourselves as separate from it. So if you don't follow uh, Aisha on Instagram, go find her at Woke Scientist. She does a lot of really well done, <laughs> thorough, thoughtful, um, very dense posts, um, but also occasionally memes too. And obviously I am with the Poor Pearls Almanac. If you enjoy the show or if you missed part of it, you can jump on uh, wherever you get your podcast. We finally got it up on iTunes. I did not realize it was not up there until like It was today. not, yeah, synced in, yeah. I yeah, guess so, we were on Google Podcasts and stuff and Spotify, but not yeah. on yeah. So, so you can now listen to us on iTunes and all the other ones. This is chapter three. Uh, we'll probably have chapter four up in a couple weeks. And uh, yeah, do you guys have any questions, thoughts, concerns, complaints, or reservations? Anything before we wrap up? I used to be a teacher. That was my... That was my I know, so that if, sounded if, like a spiel you've like yeah, quite a few yeah, times. So, so if, points, concerns, reservations. <laughs> yeah. So if you've ever heard that in a classroom, in like an English classroom in college at once, that was probably me. So Yeah, that was probably just I'm not gonna I'm yeah. not gonna uh, out myself, but if that sounds familiar, you you know why now. Uh yes, all this is on the test. You're not gonna do well. Sorry. We did not <laughs> teach anything that's on the test, it's all in the book. Yeah, just like, you know, just like oh, standardized testing. Speaking of which, just totally unrelated, I'm going to write a whole su substack piece on standardized testing and just the bullshit that we do in terms of being put through like all of these rigorous ways of being evaluated and tested. Ah! Yeah, so hopefully you guys enjoyed this. I had a lot of fun. I'm going to go make myself another old fashioned, a New England old fashioned, which I don't know if it's a real thing. But basically, you switch out the sugar for maple syrup and use black walnut bitters instead, and oh. it's made in New England, make uh, New England old fashioned. So oh, cool! I didn't know. I didn't. It sounds like a Canadian <laughs> old fashioned. I mean, it could be. I don't know. I made up the name. I was just like, I don't really feel like having more white sugar, and also, I really like the black walnut bitters. So, hmm. so here we are. Speaking of native crops, so uh, if, see, you don't have to lose anything in becoming bioregionally uh, fed, right? You're just mm -hmm. slightly changing things, and it's even better. <laughs> so uh, thank you guys so much. This was a lot of fun. Um, we'll see you guys in a couple weeks. Anything else, Aisha? No. Yeah, sign off. <laughs>